Don't let the genuinely good time that is the Dungeons and Dragons Honor Amongst Thieves film, complete with Chris Pine's dreamy blue eyes, fool you, dear viewer. In the beginning of 2023, the owners of Dungeons and Dragons could not stop rolling nat ones on their persuasion checks with fans. First, a new copy of their open gaming license leaked with some scary legal clauses. Then they promised a press release that came and went. Then they tried to explain that feedback was always the plan. And I'm sure there's been a few dust-ups since we wrote this episode. But then the fan and creator community spoke up. And after brave adventurers like Ryan Dancy, Ginny D, Noah Downs, and many, many, many more made their voices heard, cleared the area of disinformation goblins, and the dust had settled, at least for now, something hit us like a fireball in a very tiny room. D&D has had both legal and fan problems all throughout its history, and those issues actually helped to shape the entire RPG industry. So today, we're going to take a deep delve into that decades-long dungeon. This Tarrasque-sized episode is brought to you by Nebula, where you could have seen this and all of our videos early and ad-free. Subscribe for a point of inspiration. Now, the idea for this episode all started when our RPG expert and resident wizard, Eddie Webb, noticed a really odd pattern with D&D editions. Odd-numbered editions of Dungeons & Dragons were more permissive and did better as a whole, while even-numbered ones were more restrictive, causing fans and the cash to start walking away. Now, you know we love a good historical story here, so we thought we'd get a party of adventurers all kitted out for an epic-sized EC episode through the actual chronological business history of the Dungeons & Dragons IP. Our quest? To help everyone better understand how the legal issues around this single game helped chart the course for all TTRPGs, and maybe even get a glimpse at where one of our favorite games could be heading. History repeating itself and all that. But to start our journey, we knew we needed to travel back through time. That's when we realized, unfortunately, that the Time Conduit spell disappeared sometime around AD&D 2nd Edition, but Eddie told us not to worry. He remembered the location of some different ancient canonical magics of old. Ooh. So we spent weeks traveling through creepy forests, battling strange monsters, romancing every minor NPC we could possibly find, and eventually we came to find the much-lauded Time Machine. Like, literally, the OG one. All right, Eddie, fire up this bad boy! Or put your hat on it or whatever, is that all we have to do? <laughs> Okay, our first stop of time travel tourism is 1974, which was a groovy time for alpha nerds Gary Gygax and Dave Arneson, avid wargamers who got a cool idea. Rather than having miniatures represent abstract military might, as was common in tactical military games of the era, what if there were a game that told the stories of the individual soldiers? They toyed with the idea at various conventions, and soon they had created the very first edition of Dungeons & Dragons. And seeing the potential of this new game, Gary decided to form a company to publish it, along with Don Kay and Brian Bloom. Wait, where's Dave? Huh. Anyway, thus was born Tactical Studies Rules, more commonly known as TSR. At first, the game sold slowly, but by 1975, things were getting big in a hurry. This led to the two-headed giant at the heart of a lot of tabletop RPG companies. First, there's the design team making decisions they think make a great game people would want to play, and then there's the corporate side doing everything they can to sell the game and make money. Which is important if you know you want to be able to do this sort of thing for a living. Oh, and it turned out there was a lot of money to be made. TSR's gross sales in 1975 were $50,000, which grew to $300,000 in 1976, $600,000 in 1977, nearly $1 million in 1978, and over $2 million in 1979. AKA, TSR had created a whole new industry almost from scratch, and this rapidly growing company offered licenses to just about anyone that asked. Though you might be wondering, why would TSR even allow other people to make stuff for their game if it was so popular? Well, think of it like mod tools for a video game. If passionate players are making even more content for your game, that means there's more chances for curious folks to find and check out said game. And the same definitely worked for TTRPGs. So not only was TSR making licensing money off books they didn't have to invest in or produce, but these third-party products also acted as advertising for the game books that TSR was making and selling. One such agreement was with Bill Owen and Bob Bledsaw. These two originally approached TSR about creating supplements based on Owen's home campaign notes as part of TSR rather than a separate license. But Gygax and his team thought the idea of that kind of supplemental material wouldn't really sell. Because, you know, DMs could just make up whatever they wanted instead of paying someone to do it for them. 
But undeterred, on July 4th, 1976, the two instead formed the company Judges Guild to convert Owen's campaign into licensed D&D supplements, something that had never been done before. And turns out, this flagship product, City State of the Invincible Overlord, was a huge success for the new company. Even more noteworthy was an agreement with three folks in London, Ian Livingstone, Steve Jackson, and John Peake, who had formed the company Games Workshop. In 1977, TSR gave them a license to print and distribute D&D in the UK, starting them on the road to becoming the Warhammer-wielding juggernaut that they are today. Truly blood for the blood god! <clears throat> Sorry. There were also a lot of publishers who produced unlicensed support materials as well, particularly once companies saw the potential that supplements had. One noteworthy example was Bill Fawcett of Mayfair Games, who put out a line of unlicensed Rolaid supplements that even used the D&D trademark, something they were not supposed to do. But, largely, TSR ignored them, because they still felt that making the core game was where the real money was, so publishers, both official and unlicensed, grew massively during this time, which in turn also grew Daddy TSR. Then, tragedy struck. Don K. died in 1975 from a sudden heart attack. Now, Gary originally had 60% ownership when the company was formed, but at this point he wasn't able to come up with his share of buying out K's estate, so his control dropped to 30 and in the end, the company was restructured to be run by Gary, Brian, and Brian's father, Melvin Bloom, who invested some additional capital. Now, Eddie says this corporate structure drama matters later in our timeline, and we really should continue through our quest through RPG history. Though, a small problem at this point, our time machine, which did get a sweet new look, by the way, did figure out what capitalism was due to all of the business dealings that we were talking about before, and now is demanding to be paid for our next trip? Come on, man, what the- Wait, Zoe, where'd you get that platinum? <coughs> Heck yeah, sneaky cat. Okay, everyone pile in. We're 80s bound. The year is now 1982, and D&D has expanded into a couple branches. Basic set D&D, as well as advanced Dungeons & Dragons. My jam. On top of that, there were now a wide variety of official and unlicensed supplements for both games, which started to introduce rules inconsistencies and loopholes. As a completely unsurprising result, players argued loudly and frequently about what was official and what wasn't. Are unlicensed supplements even okay to use in D&D? Heck, it wasn't even obvious to the casual player what was actually official. Remember, at this point in time, tabletop RPGs were still seen as an outgrowth of the miniature wargaming scene, which had very specific rules to make each game as fair as possible, which meant determining official rules was in the hobby's blood. Some fans would even appeal the decisions of their personal dungeon masters to TSR and get back official written rulings. But the products that TSR had no control over were undermining that official authority and causing their design team headaches. Further, the gravy train was about to end. TSR had been spreading into new areas like toys, movies, and cartoons. Hey, wait, what year were we talking about again? And while they had a few successes, most were financial failures. In a June 1983 employee meeting, the executives announced they'd lost $250,000 in the last six months. It was time to make some hard decisions and fast. So the folks at TSR spent a lot of cash to summon a few familiars, aka lawyers, and put the pressure on their former partners. The licenses with Judges Guild and Games Workshop were pulled, and companies like Mayfair Games were told to cease and desist the use of the D&D trademark or they would be slain. In the legal sense, of course. And not wanting to be slain or, you know, sued, Mayfair reached an out-of-court settlement in 1984, which we will also circle back to later because that is also important. Now, in many ways, this legal pressure formed the RPG industry that we have today. Multiple publishers realized that due to this mood swing from TSR, making D&D support products was a quick way to get legally rules lawyered into oblivion, and so they made their own games instead. Some created different fantasy games in an attempt to be better than D&D, while others experimented with new genres like superheroes, science fiction, horror, military games, or even a combination of all of those things. Oh, riffs, I love you so much. Great world, terrible system. <clears throat> Sorry, getting carried away. My point is the industry was now a lot more than just Dungeons and Dragons. Ugh, but now our last time machine is out of plutonium or whatever it takes, so our party is now stuck with no way to get to our next jump in this RPG tale. But wait, seems like Jeff has made friends with a couple of wild stallions from California who have just agreed to take us along on an excellent trip to 1991. <laughs> 
Thanks, dudes. Wait, whoa, what happened in the last seven years? TSR looks real different from when we left it in 1984, y'all. Hold on, let me burn all my sorcery points because someone forgot to take the identify spell today and I'll figure out what the hell happened. <laughs> okay, I think I got it. Turns out the glut of competing RPGs derailed the aforementioned gravy train, leading to sales being down across the board, and TSR was losing cash as fast as they were making it. But due to the success of their cartoon and comic book enterprises, the company had also shifted to a more family-friendly image, a direction that Gary seemed to be against at the time. Things were changing rapidly. Then in 1985, Lorraine Williams was brought in as their vice president of administration to deal with the various creditors they'd acquired during the market slump. Meanwhile, and I'm skipping over a lot of company intrigue here, the TSR stock options have been bouncing around between the Blooms and Gygax. In the end, however, Brian Bloom was able to acquire a majority share of the company before he sold all of his stock to Williams. Gygax, seeing which way the wind was blowing, sold his remaining stock and left the company before the end of the year. By this point, the design team was well into development of a more balanced and coherent AD&D 2nd Edition. Williams threw out Gary's original notes, told the remaining designers to finish the work with their own ideas, and accelerated the team's release window. It was clear, at least to Gary Gygax, that his legacy was being intentionally and systematically stomped out of TSR. But under Williams' leadership, the lawsuits kept aflowing. First, they sued Gary Gygax's new company, New Infinities Productions, forcing Gygax to bleed money on legal fees before he declared bankruptcy. Then TSR sued Mayfair Games again, saying they were in violation of the 1984 settlement, though this could have been due to Mayfair putting out a line of supplements about demons which went against TSR's new family-friendly image, or maybe it was because Mayfair asked Gary to write a foreword for one of their new books. But, you know, whatever the reasons, the two companies finally reached an agreement sometime in 1993 where TSR could buy the entire Rolaids line and bury the offending material never to see the light of day. And at this point, no one escaped the reach of TSR's legal team of shadowy assassins. For instance, as the internet grew, fans posted articles about their favorite games online or shared files from their home campaigns. Williams, who had never really been in touch with the gaming community, treated these the same as publishers violating TSR's trademarks and summoned more legal vengeance, sending cease and desist orders to fans. Even general RPG groups unrelated to D&D were hit with this chromatic spray of legal red tape. Fans started calling TSR T dollar sign R, both to avoid online searches and as an act of defiance, before leaving in droves to find other games to play. Ah, but fan discontent was only one head of the Hydra TSR had to slay before it could get back on top. Collectible card games like Magic the Gathering, published by up-and-coming company Wizards of the Coast, were encouraging people to spend their recreational money elsewhere. This new lack of revenue from the RPG genre was putting distributors out of business and making it harder to ship the books that were still being produced. Not to mention, since TSR focused on business over design at this point, it led them to put out their own glut of advanced D&D supplements that horribly unbalanced the game. All these factors encouraged fans to vote with their wallets. And wouldn't you know it, TSR sales plummeted again, and they declared bankruptcy in 1997. Soon after, those plucky Wizards of the Coast swooped in and bought TSR with the huge but undisclosed stacks of cash they got from people buying magic cards instead of D&D books. So now we have a new player in the game. Wait, how did we end up at a Circle K? And where did our most excellent time-traveling companions go? Oh, great. Now how are we going to get to the year 2000? I mean, we could just wait. Or... <laughs> Oh, hey there, year 2000. Oh, excuse us, sir. Oh, wow. Looks like Wizards of the Coast was just bought by Hasbro for a cool $325 million. Dang. Ah, and would you look at that? There's a brand spanking new third edition of Dungeons and Dragons for fans to see. But Wizards of the Hasbro did have a lot of animosity to overcome, both from fans and other publishers. And that was something that Ryan Dancy, yes, the same Ryan Dancy from our Extra Politics show over on our Twitch channel, had to address as the business head of Wizards RPG department. Aside from making sure that the third edition was well-designed and produced, he came up with two legal initiatives to help rebuild the gaming community. The first of which was the D20 system trademark license. 
This was a license that allowed publishers to use some of D&D's trademark terms, as well as a distinctive D20 system logo, so publishers could show that their products were fully compatible with Dungeons & Dragons. This required publishers to exclude specific rules, like character creation, mention that buyers needed the core rule books published by Wizards of the Coast, and had them adhere to a content policy, so D20 books were in alignment with the D&D brand. More importantly, however, was the creation of the Open Game License, or OGL, which allowed anyone to modify, copy, and redistribute key rules text from D&D in their own products. This meant that you could use the exact same rules as D&D in making your compatible material without having to coordinate with WotC first. Of course, while legal precedents have historically ruled that you can't truly copyright game mechanics, these licenses were an olive branch to win back fans and publishers who had been turned away by TSR's litigious path in the 90s. And it worked. This was the time we now call the D20 boom. Anyone, publishers and fans alike, could release D&D-related products as long as they followed the terms of the OGL and the D20 license if they wanted to use the trademarks. So now, after two whole editions and companies later, RPG books were back to the heyday of basically printing money for about five years. Okay, gang, what time period appropriate method of pop culture time travel could we use to get us to 2005 now? Nope, 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 nope. You can seriously doubt my commitment to Sparkle Motion all you want. We are walking. I'm keeping my stupid man suit. Huh, faster than I thought. Anyway, 2005. Oh, life was good if you were a nerd. Pop culture had become mainstream with rebooted hits like Battlestar Galactica and Doctor Who. Heck, even Hasbro was having big success with Transformers, and their first live-action movie was blowing up on the horizon. Thank you, Mr. Bay. So, naturally, they wanted D&D to be a big brand in the same way. Of course, not with a live-action movie or anything. That would be totally ridiculous box office poison. I mean, we can't even imagine what would have happened if they actually released a D&D movie before 2023. Wow, I don't even want to think about that darkest timeline. But to try to move them in that direction, they felt they had to get more control over D&D again. Rumors started to circulate that the D20 trademark license would be rescinded. Then publishers got nervous and removed the trademark from their products, preemptively getting ahead of any possible incoming legal meteor swarm. But it turned out to be worse than that. A new fourth edition of D&D was announced that not only would be a radical rules departure from the previous edition, but also wouldn't use either the OGL or the D20 trademark license. Instead, they presented the GSL, or Game System License, that required an upfront fee of... Oh, wow! $5,000 in order to print books compatible with the new edition. That is a lot of money for small publishers, probably more than some of them would ever expect to make back from any profits. Further, agreeing to the GSL contract stipulated that publishers could never again use the OGL in any future products. Yikes. By this point, however, a loophole had been discovered. Okay, so the official D20 system trademark license didn't allow publishers to reprint character creation rules because they wanted to keep people buying the core rulebooks. But the OGL, or D&D rules minus their trademarks, just said that you couldn't use D&D's full character creation rules. So, if you made your own character creation rule system, a company could put out an entire game book using the rest of the OGL and have a game that used 99% of the D&D rules, but didn't require any official D&D books whatsoever. And that's just what Lisa Stevens and Eric Mona did. Previously, their company, Paizo, had been publishing two official D&D magazines for five years, called, unsurprisingly, Dungeon and Dragon. However, Wizards didn't renew their license in 2007, so in 2008, they released their own game, Pathfinder, which was an evolution of the beloved 3rd edition rule set. True, Hasbro eventually released a final version of the GSL that removed both the upfront fee and the requirement to stop using the OGL, but by that point, the damage had been done. Which again, is feeling like it's hitting pretty close to home with the early 2023 D&D kerfuffle. But 2010 Paizo was loving it. Pathfinder was outselling D&D, something that hadn't been possible since the declining days of TSR. Now, in the Dungeons & Dragons space, I think you won't find a more contentious argument than whether 4th edition was good, or a scourge created in order to try and capitalize on the popularity of MMO mechanics. Eddie doesn't think it's bad and is quite fond of it, whereas I may have already played my hand in that particular department. But regardless, the combination of business mismanagement and the misreading of the community resulted in a game that both failed to connect with its core audience and led to the creation of a direct competitor that the RPG community seemed to like more.
No, Eddie, we are not gonna argue this again. I already told you that fourth edition is a load of war. What is happening? Has our nerd rage opened a wormhole to 2016? Quick, let's dive in before we remember that we're friends. Whew, did we make it? Quick, everyone check your phones for the date. Oh, oh yeah, this is definitely 2016, all right. Hey, nice shiny catch, SVP. By this point, Hasbro buried 4th edition and the GSL. What was originally called D&D Next was eventually christened as the 5th edition we know and love today. And also critically, Hasbro revealed that they would release 5th edition under the original OGL license. And shocked Pikachu face here, between that and the fact that 5e was the cleanest, most mass market friendly version of the game to date, 5th edition turned out to be the best selling edition ever. No foolin'. According to Hasbro, 5e has sold better than any other edition in the history of Dungeons & Dragons. Actually, better than 1st through 4th editions combined. And lots of indie publishers got back in on the action. With the rise of PDF and print-on-demand publishing, anyone could make an OGL product. And the combination of that with the increase in popularity of streaming platforms like Twitch and YouTube allowed for gamers, performers, and of course nerdy-ass voice actors to turn their games into actual plays that everyone could enjoy. But Hasbro actually went a step further here, creating the DM's Guild to allow people to use certain parts of the D&D intellectual property in their products and sell them on a centralized website, with a cut going to Mama Hasbro, of course. And once again, everyone made a lot of money. Which is why what happened in January of 2023 is surprising in a lot of ways, but also kind of exactly what you might expect if you look at the constant legal back and forth throughout D&D's lifetime. Because it turns out major corporations either don't have great institutional memory or whatever company owns D&D always fails their modified memory save and they repeatedly make the same mistakes again and again. Every time, D&D opens their license to other people. Everyone does well, including the company that owns it. But every time the owners of D&D get litigious, wanting to squeeze out more profits for the Dark Powers, er, shareholders, they end up botching it. People leave D&D behind, and the RPG industry goes in a new direction. Of course, as of the time of this episode's release, we've seen some pretty promising steps in the right direction from WotC in order to course correct and kind of get back on the right track. They trashed their new draconian OGL, dropped their licensing fees, moved a whole bunch of 5e content into the Creative Commons, some even by accident. Hey there, Strahd, be seeing you later. And they seem to have become more open to community feedback than ever before. So who knows? Maybe they are learning from their past mistakes and finally realize that if they do put long-term design over short-term profits, spoiler alert, profits still come. But if the owners of our favorite game don't learn their lessons and won't let it thrive, then maybe we as the community have to do what all good adventuring parties do. We gear up, protect our community, and rebuild it into something exciting that allows us to keep telling stories together with our friends. And at that point, no amount of pining over Chris Pine is going to save them. Thank you so much, everyone, for watching this gargantuan size episode of Extra Credits. We had an absolute blast putting it together for all of you. It was a labor of love, and I'm so psyched that it's out in the world. And if you liked this lengthy experiment, there's actually something you can do to let us know. Use the link in the description below and subscribe to Nebula, our creator-owned and operated streaming service. Here, let me explain how this is all connected. So what you just watched obviously took way more time and resources than a regular episode does. And one reason we were able to take this swing and see if longer form content resonated with you all and if it's stuff you'd sort of like to see more of in the future without slowing down all of our other regular releases is that every time one of you signs up for Nebula using our link, how do I put it? Uh, our DM daddy Nebula throws some gold in our direction, which really does go a long way to support the entire adventuring party of writers, illustrators, producers, voice actors, and editors that make each of our shows possible. Now, with Nebula, you can watch a ton of shows early and ad-free. Oh, and not just ours, mind you. Because with the help of a bunch of our creator friends, we came up with an awesome feature called Nebula First, where you get access to a ton of great content from creators like Jacob Geller, Becky Stern, Legal Eagle, and just tons more, all of whom post their videos earlier than you'd ever see them on YouTube. And of course, we release all of our Extra History series episodes at least a full week early and ad-free with Nebula First. But that's really just the beginning, because Nebula is also home to a ton of exclusive original content that you just can't find anywhere else. I've made some myself. Jeff and I both made Nebula classes in our areas of expertise, 
and more originals from a ton of your favorite creators are getting released all the time. Heck, even one of my absolute favorite video essayists, Lindsay Ellis, is now releasing all of her content exclusively on Nebula. I watch them the instant they drop. They are great. I cannot wait for more. Now, if you sign up for Nebula using our link below, you actually get our discounted price, which works out to around $2.50 a month for an annual plan, which not only is like 40% off the regular price, but it's also less than a cup of coffee in any reasonable establishment. And using that link really does help support myself and the rest of the EC crew continue to make the content that you love watching and that we love making. And I know I've said it before and I hope it doesn't come off as pedantic, but thank you so much for that. It's a huge help. And yeah, I really hope to see you over there on Nebula real soon because I truly believe you're really gonna love watching it. A million big old thanks to Skylar Holmes, Kuya Koi, Joseph Blame, Dominic Valenciana, Casey Muscha, Arcolite Games, Angela Valenciana, and Ahmed Ziad Turk for being fantastic legendary patrons.